Pearl, everything is ready. Thank you for teaching. You can start in that. Cool. Well, let's begin. Uh, I'd like to begin by inviting us to chat in the highlight of our day or yesterday in celebration. What's cool that's going on? For instance, for me, I'm getting to hang out with my twin nieces that are six. And just seeing how they, they interact with the world and everything is a big adventure. What else would I go to the bug zoo if it wasn't for my nieces? Yeah. Cool. Jackie, I'm happy you're here too. Yes. Yeah. So let's use it to get us. I'm sorry. That sounds good. Um oh, lots of family related stuff. I can relate. Okay. Today's class was supposed to be with Venerable Jikmi. Uh, she bailed out as soon as she agreed. She agreed, and then half hour later, she's like, I can't do that. And I was like, but I just advertised it. She's like, yeah, but you caught me before I had my coffee in the morning. So then... I got her to agree to come to Friday's class. And then she bailed out on Friday's class. <laughs> so she's going to come on a week today. And uh, she'll be here for 45 minutes. So she'll talk a little about her experience with Benaya. And then... Uh, I'm going to ask her some questions, and then there's a chance for everyone else to ask questions. Mm. That's the plan with Venerable Jigme. The class that I wanted to do when she was here is class five. So we're on class five today. Um, but I want to skip it because... Uh, it's mostly about full ordination, and uh, she can talk about that. So we're skipping class five. And some of the course materials, class six and seven, is swapped around and mixed up, and it was really confusing for me. So if you look at the I don't, in the notes, the course notes, um, I don't know what ACI put up online, but there's homeworks, there's quizzes, there's a final, there's answer key. And then there's something called class notes. If they're up there, they're out of order. So we're gonna do class six today. It's not the class on the 10 non-virtues and the karmic results of those. So if you look at your homework and it's totally not reflective of what we talked about today, go to the next class. If something seems wrong, it is. Okay. Um, 
I was doing a Q and A yesterday with a group in China. So they read the question out in Chinese, and then I answer in English, and then I'm translated. I was giving this like really intricate, beautiful example, and then someone raised their hand and they're like, "What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, are you sure you're answering the right question?" It's like I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't read Chinese. <laughs> I was not answering the right question. So if something seems wrong, it is. Today's class is on taking and keeping vows, not the results of the 10 virtues or non-virtue. Uh, I want to start the class going off on a huge tangent. We're just going to like, uh, cool. Moan says class seven. Thank you. Um, and I want to, my goal of the, for me personally, and what I hope we can do journeying together in this class, isn't just to learn about Vinaya, but it's to be inspired by Vinaya, and isn't just to learn about ethical principles, and all of the Tibetan customs about that. But to be inspired to examine our own ethical principles and how do we track those or how do we keep those? How do we gain clarity on those? And so for me, I'm trying to use this opportunity to kind of re-examine my own faith and my own beliefs, my own ideas. And so to facilitate that today, I want to look at different lists of morality from people around the world, you know, through history. And we'll just go through some different ideas. You know, we can do the Prati Moksha list, but there's... There's lots of cool lists. So I want to look at some different traditions, some different genders, as opposed to the male-dominated Buddhist tradition, and see if there's uh, some other things we can draw from that might be kind of fun. And then we'll do uh, an exercise to look at our own core values and discuss those in a breakout room. Then we'll blow through the class content in the last half hour. So it's delightfully bizarre. Like what happens if you suddenly gain both sex characteristics then what happens to your vows? It's a big question, apparently, 2,500 years ago. Are you a monk? Are you a nun? So we'll, we'll look at these deep, important questions also. Okay. So let's look at the EPT. So again, it says class five. It sort of is class five, sort of not. And let's look at the next one. Cool. Okay. Different moral codes from around the world. I'm not going to be great at pronouncing all of these. I'm not even positive what language it is. If it's Arabic or here's what we got. This is from a these are taken. If you look at the vowmuseum.com, that's a friend of mine named Will Duncan. Uh, Will and I did three year retreat together. And he's an amazing teacher. And he he studied a lot of traditions. Um 
So on his website, he's got something called the Val Museum, and it's a collection of different moral codes of different people around the world. And I just straight up shoplifted all the stuff from his website. Mm. And him and I uh, had some interesting conversations about them. So Abdul Abdulilak Gud Duvani died in 1190. I'm not sure when he was born. The Sufi master. Um, and I spent some time. This is the one we'll spend the most time with. I looked him up. Super cool. He has something called Prayer of the Heart. And he had eight rules for living. The first Hushter Dem. So this is his, like, he, uh, um, oh, I can't remember his life story, but he had a spiritual awakening and became a teacher. And these were his rules. These were his ideas of how to live a good life. One is have awareness of breath. And he said, like, move from breath to breath so the mind isn't constantly distracted. Instead, be in constant presence. And with every breath, be in remembrance of what is real, like ultimate. So his, his worldview is very much God. Like he would call that divine presence God. Uh, um, or Allah. And it's very much like being constantly in remembrance of God, the divine. And he's, he said with every breath, there's the sound of the letter Ha, uh, which I guess is the divine name of Allah. So even with every breath, the sound of every breath, we can remember God. We can remember the unseen essence, the beauty that pervades all reality. And his description of the expression of that divinity is, we'll see, is, is, is the idea of God. So be present with every breath. Don't let your attention wander. Always, every situation. Second one, Nazar Ber Kadem. Watch your step. And uh, he's cool. A lot of these are multi levels. So, you know, level one, just be mindful. Don't trip over stuff <laughs> you just watch where you're going and pay attention to your circumstances keep your intention before every step you take keep your wish for freedom ever present in your mind so we're using our walking our steps which is something we do a lot to help us be present in the present but also with our motivation feel when is the right time for action when is the right time for inaction and when is the right time for a pause and then uh, Another theme for him is using that idea of being present to get out of the way of, to, to smash our self-cherishing. Like, 
go from thoughts of me, 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 you know, loving me more than I love everyone else, like break away from that. So with every step, you know, don't trip, keep our intention, and then evaluate our action. Is this action, is it right? Is it the right time for it? Like that. His third one. Next slide. The par der vatan. It's, it's called the journey home or the journey to the homeland. And it's cool, he says, remember you're traveling from the world of appearances to the world of reality. Like, don't get caught up in the world of illusion. Thinking that things have, you know, inherent qualities. Getting so caught up that our interpretation of the world must be everyone's interpretation. The world appears one way, but it exists in another. And we need to live on both realities, but we're trying to get to ultimate reality so that we can understand the world of appearances and he's like make that your journey home he says that journey home requires a teacher and it means traveling it's an inward journey looking at oneself Next, Halvat der Engelen, something like that. Solitude in the crowd. Solitude in the crowd. So he he's speaking about retreat, and it's cool. He talks about two kinds of retreat. One is a outward kind of retreat. Like, like go into a retreat cabin and try to come in contact with spiritual truth. Go on a retreat. Withdraw the senses. Until that spiritual world manifests. Okay, that's his first idea of um, solitude in the crowd. The second is the hidden retreat, where inwardly we're staying in touch with that, that sense of divinity or that sense of what is real. While we're outwardly surrounded by people, so outwardly be with people, inwardly be with God. Be what is it in the world, not of the world? Did I get that right? So to be, you know, outwardly doing our thing, but inwardly, you know, Gishimaka would say, like, we're on a secret Bodhisattva mission. On the outside, I'm a youth worker. I teach yoga. Inside, I'm destroying suffering for others. That's my real job.
Number five. Is this is this fun for people? <laughs> okay. Should we keep going or we don't have to? We can go back to Vinaya at any point. Just voice your opinions in the chat. Yad Gerd. I'm sure I'm terrible at this pronunciation. Yad Gerd. Concentrate on the divine presence. Um, you can see the uh, Rumi esque wording. Remember your friend. Remember God. Remember the divine. And then he says, let the prayer of your tongue be the prayer of your heart. Let the prayer of your tongue be the prayer of your heart. And I thought that was so beautiful. Like what comes out of our mouth should reflect our highest, most beautiful place in our heart. Like sometimes the habit of just bitching about the weather or whatever, it's just easy. We were talking about the advice from Venable Marut. And we're not going to complain about the minor trivial things in life. And, uh, you know, I'm st still making my list of stupid things that I complain about. You know, like, I think I shared that the moment after playing that audio for others. You know, complaining that I have to cook three meals a day for myself. Or the other day it was, there's nothing to eat in my house. My cupboards are literally full. I just, I buy food and there's no room. And I have the audacity to complain that there's no food in my house. Meaning there's no food that I can't just immediately grab and shove in my face <laughs> is what I mean. There's not like no one living in my house following me around, preparing my meals for me. <laughs> is what there's no food in my house means. I literally can't just grab something and throw it in my face. So there's no food. And it's a habit of just complaints. That's not my heart, I hope. Right? So can we let the prayer of the tongue be the prayer of the heart? What's my highest heart aspiration? And if I'm constantly mindful of that, then can that manifest through my words and through my actions? Really, like, God, that's all I need is this one thing, like, concentrate on the divine presence, my, my own inner truth, and then let that guide, I can let that guide my actions and my speech and my thoughts. That'd be awesome. Number six, Baz Gush. Returning from distraction and going back. Returning from distraction and going back. What are we going back to? It's going back to ultimate reality, going back to the divinity, going back to God. So we're, we're traveling around 
distraction to distraction. Come back. Return from that distraction and go back to that truth. Go back to that divine truth. He says, have no aim but truth. Number seven. Niga dust, niga dust, attentiveness. Uh, struggle with weird thoughts. Get rid of them. Struggle with alien thoughts. Keep your mind on what you're doing. Um, be watchful. Be aware of what catches your attention. Learn to withdraw your attention from undesirable objects. Which is uh, a lot of discipline. Because we walk around, like I, I notice when I walk around, it's the, sometimes it's the, it's the obscure or the new or the extreme that catches our attention. And advertising plays on that. Our world plays on that, like to get clicks, to get likes. It has, seems like everything has become more extreme. And uh, not necessarily in a healthy way. So to try to regain control of what we want to focus on instead of the billions and billions of dollars that are spent to get us to focus on what other people want us to focus on. You know, algorithms that are designed to uh, give us a little dopamine release to keep our attention. In 1100, he was like, yeah, don't do that. Be vigilant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number eight, last one. Yad dust. Continued remembrance. Perpetual invocation. Continual remembrance. And then a constant prayer. Be constantly in remembrance of the divine. Become used to meditation. A word for meditation is bhavana. To burn something in. Sanskrit word bhavana. It's like we do something over and over and over and over till it becomes natural. So recognize the presence of God in your heart over and over and over and over. So that there's just a natural, constant awareness of divinity. Like that inner love, if we can tap into that and then train our mind to come back to that over and over again. If we could do that with whatever we're dealing with in the world, he says that and we've achieved mindfulness. What's his definition of mindfulness? When you can maintain that presence of inner love, no matter what you're doing, he's like, that's mindfulness. Then we've achieved mindfulness.
to a list. I thought, I hope you liked it. Let's look at another list. Uh, Deepa Ma, she lived 1911 to 1989. Mm. I wasn't familiar with her until I read about her yesterday. And she's awesome. Apparently, she was like four foot tall, tall, and just this crazy powerful woman. But um, she had a couple of children die in childbirth, and then her husband died, and she's just like, "This is unreal. Something has to change." And um, found meditation. I think she lived in Burma, and uh, and instantly just attained really crazy states of meditation, and did that all while being a mom. So she had a very busy life, single mom, and her. She was a. So she became a great teacher, great meditation teacher. And there's a very famous meditator named Joseph Goldstein, who's great. If you ever can access Joseph Goldstein, see him teach or get his recordings. He's amazing. Um, he said, hey, you. I'm going to say hi to everyone. Why did I look? Look right there. Oh, yes. Yeah. Can you wave? Okay. These are all my friends. We're okay. doing a class. I can't see them. No. Okay, I'll unplug. Okay, everyone, can you all say hi? Hi. This. Right. Hi. Hello, Hi. Hi. Look. Here we go. There we are. Okay. And now beat it. I gotta teach. Mm -hmm. You can hang out if you want. Yeah. Hold on. Right on. Dropping my brother's kid into drinking coffee. Give me that. It's an adult drink. Okay. I know. Okay, so he said the last time I saw Deepa Ma before she died, he was telling the story. She said, sit for two days, meditate for two days, and he laughed. And she's like, what? And he's like, you mean a two-day retreat? Like, you know, if you give me a schedule, I can do that. And she's like, no. Go and meditate for two days. <laughs> and he, uh, he's like, well, that's impossible. And she's like, just don't be lazy. <laughs> and... Uh, he said it, he just she just had this uncompromising compassion. Don't be lazy. Just go do it. And a lot of her advice is um, kind of hard like that, like just relentless. There you are. Hold on. Now the background's better. It's you. All right. Did you do Miwa? So everything's like the same? Yeah. Oh. Okay. First advice, choose one meditation and stick with it. Like we can't go from meditation to meditation to meditation and progress. We have to uh, stay with one technique. Stick with it for a while. Train in one technique. And uh, 
you know, Mission Michael's advice was also to do that, but to try to go deep in one meditation and then until it just stops being powerful, until it stops being juicy. And then maybe try to go a little bit further because there might be something on the other side of that plateau. Like we can't stop as soon as we get bored the first time. Try to do a little more than that. We have to go a little deeper than that. Okay. Her second advice. Where's those balloons? Second advice, meditate every day. She's like, just practice. Don't think we'll do it later. She's like, just do it now. Now, practice now. Any situation is workable. Each of us has the each of us has more power than we give ourselves credit for. Like we don't have to be upset because the we didn't get on the plane. There's a plane tomorrow. We could get on that plane. Or if the clothes don't show up, that's okay. We have the power to deal with the problems in life. And if we could access that, it's not just that we're helping ourselves, it's that we're helping others as well. If we have the strength to walk through the fire of life, it inspires other people like, oh, wow, if that person can, they can have that kind of a problems and walk through it with love and grace i can do that with my problems too next slide she says practice patience she calls it the most important virtue for developing mindfulness and concentration The most important virtue for meditation, being patient. Number five, free your mind from your stories. I love this. Like we get so caught up that my story is the story. And then we react to the world as if all of our stories are true. And um, that's, I mean, we can go really deep with that. Like a word is a story. And so we conceptualize our world in the only way that we can. It, we have to, it's functional. Even the idea of conceptualizing this object into a cup is a story let alone the good or the bad or the drama. She's like, free your mind from grasping onto those stories as if they've got inherent truth to them. Do you want to read this one? Yeah. Cool the fire of emotions. She's like, anger is fire cool it off the opposite have fun she's like she's like i'm quite happy <laughs> this is her quote i'm pretty happy you know, if you meditate you'll also be happy her eighth was simplify too much luxury is a hindrance to practice too much stuff hinders practice. Too much extravagance hinders practice. Don't get caught up in constantly wanting bigger, faster, fancier, more. 
simplicity. Number nine, cultivate a spirit of blessing. Mm. I think it, she's talking about being present with people. Like be present with people around you. And if we're trying to act with kindness, if we have an ethos of value, of being it'll inspire us to be attentive with every moment. So Bishop Michael tells a story of a monk in hell that when someone comes into the temple, Champa will, you know, watch where that person's eyes go because he wants to serve them. So he wants to know what they're thinking. So if their eye goes to a chair, maybe they're tired. You know, get them in a seat. If their eyes goes to the water, maybe they want water. If it goes to the fridge, maybe they're hungry. So that comes out of a desire to help people. So if we have a desire to help people, that fuels our attentiveness in the moment. And our tenth is, it's a circular journey. Um, meditate. All right. Let's do a couple more. You good? All right. Let's do the next slide. This is from the uh, Shiva Samhita. Shiva Samhita is a very famous text. I think one of the reasons is it's got some yoga poses listed in it. It's one of the earlier texts with some yoga poses. Mm. And so now we have a bit more of a yogic philosophy. Um, first one. Understanding that all efforts bear fruit. Uh, I'm assuming that that's a lesson on karma. I didn't get a chance to study this more in depth, but all of our actions have a result. Second quality is be clear about that. There's Karma is relentless. There's no, uh, we don't get any freebies. Every thought, every action, every word, every every single one. Santa doesn't miss a moment of our good and bad deeds. Karma's like that. Third, oh, this is a good one. Respect and faith in one's teacher. Fourth quality, have equanimity. Fifth, control the senses. Sixth, moderate eating. It's amazing how many of these lists mention eating. And uh, I was debating Will about that, the guy that consolidated these lists. I was like, Will, did you ever notice like how many of these lists mention eating? And um, he had just finished a course on teaching ethics. And they had had this big discussion because they noticed the same thing. None of them have anything about sleep. But um, eating is super common. So something to think about. Let's go to the next one. Eve Ensler. Anybody know Eve Ensler? Playwright, author, activist, born in 1953. We'll just do, I don't know, maybe five more minutes. 
of these lists. Cherish your solitude. But I think that's great advice. Seek solitude, cherish it. And I think, again, we can look at that on different levels. Could be a physical solitude, could be a mental solitude. Take trains by yourself to places you've never been. Um, I love that because it allows us to be somebody new. It allows us to um, get out of an environment that reinforces who we think we are. When we travel, we have an opportunity to not be burdened by how other people expect us to be. And the freedom that that brings, I think, is really cool. She says, sleep out alone under the stars. Um, I've done that for during three year retreat many 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 days i agree we're back did you want to show what you made She might show you something cool. Let's give it a second. The stick shift. Do new things. Like, don't get stuck. In patterns. Go so far away that you stop being afraid of not coming back. Mm. Number six. Say no when you don't want to do something. I think that's great advice. I was just talking to my grandmother, and she just retired. She was the first woman to sit on the Supreme Court in Canada. And um, she's like, years ago, I just decided I'm not doing things I don't want to do anymore. I'm done. Whether they're work related, whether they're social activities. And she's just like, she's probably almost 70 now or a little bit older. She's just like, I just, I refuse to do things that I don't want to do out of some sort of weird social obligation. And what a waste of time. <laughs> And I think that's, uh, I'm sure we can take that to an extreme that's too far, but uh, there's some beautiful truth to that. Say yes if your instincts are strong, even if everyone around you disagrees. And that, I think, feeds into the eighth of Decide whether we want to be liked or admired. So I hope that translates into other languages, but being liked is doing something so that people like us it could be very surface level. Like, I don't know, giving, I don't know, just giving like a, it's like, I see people behaving in a way to somebody to get their approval just so that they get some power in return, like politics, people pleaser, thank you. You know, like politicians positions that change with the wind because they're not really doing what's, it's just short term, so. Finding a difference between liked and admired. Admired to me feels like you've done the right thing for a long time. 
and people respect that. The side of fitting in is more important than finding out what you're doing here. Cool. Ray wants me to show you a cool little box that she made that she put all her little treasures in. Like a little cat. And then she says, believe in kissing. Uh, she is the author of the Vagina Monologues. She says, believe in kissing. Okay, last list. Build a, build a house. Okay, these are the seven deadly sins. Awesome. It's a little house. There's little drawers. It's pretty awesome. You can put, put all your little treasures in it. Seven deadly sins. Um, real quick. The, the one that I think is cool, when we look at the seven deadly sins, is like some of them have been come up. Um, okay. You know, like gluttony is, uh, it's no longer a sin. Like it's a, it's what we do on a, all of our national holidays is we're totally gluttonous as a national pastime. It's what it's expected of us on Thanksgiving to be totally gluttonous. Or the idea of, of greed, like the idea of, making the most money having as a society valuing people because they have 50 billion dollars like it's become a it's gone from a deadly sin to a virtue almost so it's interesting to see how some of these have gone from sins to virtue almost okay next slide Here's our list. We will go into breakout group. Have a look at the list. Why are we doing this? Part of the Naya is understanding. We said we have to go to a enlightened being to understand cause and result. These actions bring these results. And so those lists are really important. Body moksha lists are very important. And then we track that. For me, I've taken inspiration. What, what are my core values outside of that? Okay, don't kill, don't steal. Got it. And I've tracked that for a long time. I've really tried to live my life by those ethical principles. But sometimes they, I lose things along the way. Like... What's my core values? Being adventurous was one that really stuck out for me. Or reading, you know, nonfiction. Or, or um, so here's a list. I'd like you to pick three of them. And then in groups of Three, share why you picked those three. Like, why are those values something that are important to you? Why is personal growth important? Okay, so the task is pick three. It doesn't have to be on this list. You can pick a different three. And then share why you picked those three. And we'll take 10 minutes. Cool.
Allah bekannt ist. It's a good sign. People are using last mm. seconds of the right? Do you want to show them what you made? Can you hold it up to the camera? That's somewhere there. there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, now you can show them more easily. What? Just hold it up. She made a laptop. What's it say on the front? It says love. Yeah. Wow. There's the camera Thanks. there. Do you want to show them how you use your laptop? It's got the whole keypad and everything. Space bar. It's pretty good. Good job. You are such an artist. Cool. Um, I would love to know how it went, but then we won't cover any of class. So I hope that was uh, joyful for you. Let's do some class content in 20 minutes. Okay, who can't take vows? Um, you have to be a proper, it's called a basis in Tibetan. The word is ten. And like you have to be a, ten is like a foundation basis. So you're not a 10, you're not a proper basis if you live on the continent unpleasant sound. Buddhist mythology has four continents. Uh, we live on the West continent called Zambu because there's some tree that drops a fruit into the wall water and the sound is zombu. <laughs> so it's named uh, after the sound of the thing that drops from the tree zombu. something like that and the northern continent lifespans are fixed apparently everyone lives 500 years why is that a problem The attitude to take a Vinaya vow is what? What's the motivation we have to have to take vows? Someone said Buddhahood. It's not because we are in a Hinayana paradigm. Someone said freedom. It's, yeah, it's wanting nirvana but it's renunciation so if we if life is too good we can't develop renunciation so apparently renunciation is hard on that continent then there's this theme in vinaya about pure sexual energy somehow being related to vows and to me, this gets a little weird. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the shelf for me. On the background, there's some seems to be some connection between the purity of our energy, our most basic energies, and the capacity to keep vows. So apparently, if we're deficient in the male or female energy, we won't be strong-willed enough to keep a vow. Good morning. Um, I'm on a live. We're on a call here. This is my dad. Hey. It's family time here at ACI9. All right. Um... What's the third one? If you have no sexual organs, or if you have both of them. So I don't know if they just 
if you've got both, if they just couldn't figure out if you're a monk or a nun, or they couldn't figure out the middle ground, like 2,500 years ago, did they have a problem with which bathroom people were going to use? And have we just not figured it out 2,500 years later? Like we're still struggling with things that maybe don't need to be so hard. I don't know. Committing the immediate misdeeds. So really like the worst of the worst deeds. Trying to kill a Buddha. Killing your mom or your dad. Killing an Arhat. Uh, creating a schism in the Sangha. Uh, if, if we do those, then the vows don't form. Imposter, if you're pretending, this means like, um, if like there was a, Keshla said he was approached by a journalist and they wanted to sit in on a full ordination ceremony so that they could write about it. And those ceremonies are private. You can't, you can't go sit in on those. So if you were just there for like a fake reason, or you're some people would take ordination to avoid the getting drafted in the military, um, or to avoid a bunch of debt. So they were, were so reasons like that. You can't get your vows if you're just there to. Uh, escape your debt. And the last is having wrong worldviews. Like if you really don't believe in harm and emptiness, it wouldn't make sense to take the vows they didn't stick because that's the basis of them. Next slide. Anastasia, did I speed up too much? A little bit. All right, it's the end of class rush. I'll try to chill out. How do you lose vows? Uh, you can give them back, apparently. Mm, there's a ceremony to give back vows. And uh, I guess Michael Todd, he really spoke very strongly against this. Like, why would anybody do that? Like if you take the vows because you have renunciation for samsara, you understand how life is pervaded by suffering. You have an understanding that there could be a, a way out. And you take these vows and you commit for a lifetime. Why would... How could you give them back? Like, did samsara get better? Like, did sorry, samsara get so much better that you're like, actually, you know, it's pretty good. You know, I don't actually want to get out. We're, it's cool. Samsara is all right. And uh, so he wasn't a big fan of giving vows back. You can lose vows by dying. So these vows last a lifetime. And once we die, that's it. And it's interesting the Tibetan reads die and move on to the next life. It doesn't just say die. It says you it says dying and going on to the next life. Um Here's the weird bit, having both sexual organs appear on your body. Um, having your sexual organs change three times. Like if you naturally somehow go from male to female, back to male, back to female. Apparently that was a problem back in the day. Um, and it's not clear if you get like, 
if that happens three times if you're okay and then it's the fourth that it's not okay or is it like three strikes you're out i'm not sure the next one is more interesting to me it is losing your core virtue so if we do something it refers to doing one of the four or main bad deeds uh, of a monk and we'll cover them in the next class but it's this discussion about we lose all of our virtue like what's the difference between virtue and core of virtue and, and uh this discussion kind of ends up with this question and it says we lose all our virtue it's like how much virtue do we lose by getting angry at a bodhisattva it's like a lot and uh, i did a big journey into finding out what the core virtue means by using the acip database and I wanted to um, show people how to use that and the benefit of using that. Um, we don't have time, though. Do we have time? We have 12 minutes. Let's try it. Why not? Bear with me for a second. Okay. You guys see my screen? Yeah, all good. So this is transliteration for a core of virtue, Gaitsa Che. This is the search engine um, that Geshe Michael has created to search all of the input text. So these are different files uh, Tibetan dictionary, the 36 courses the foundation and tantra courses tangier words of the buddha sungbum tibetan contraries and so forth so all of these different folders we can look to see where does core of virtue come up because it's not clear to me from aci 9 what it means so if i search it oh okay Ketsache to cut the root of virtue. At the bottom, we can see, oh, this is from Rangin Yeshe Dictionary. So it's just a, it's just going to be the definition. Let's look at the next match. Cutting off the root of virtue through wrong views. And then it gives this other thing. So we could copy paste that and probably go down an interesting rabbit hole to see where that leads us now we've got another explanation oh where's this from oh this happens to be from course nine this is from our reading so we see that this comes up in course nine the basic nature of losing our virtue is a person's they do it just says you lose it but then it talks about how that most basic virtue is regained so then we can see how does one regain that virtue hmm. 
next match. And we're just searching files. I want to show you one other thing. Now we're going to get a whole bunch of stuff that's not translated. This is from, you can see at the bottom, Gaso Spiong. Okay, that means Sojong. Okay, these are the Sojong texts. And we can just see they're not translated. These are all different texts. Jatsankapa, Dharma Bhadra, Panchen Lama, Kelsang Gyatso, Choni Lama, Sarah Jetson. So there's all of these texts that just haven't been translated. And uh, I was always so, like, Tibetan language is dying. Uh, there's way more text input than we'll ever translate. Tibetan's dying. The knowledge is dying in the world. So why is Geshe Michael frantically raising money inputting text as fast as possible when there's already a thousand year backlog of text what's the point we could stop now find a hundred translators and it would take a hundred years and um, now we just are at this incredible so i've been bothered by that for 10 years of like special can't we just relax <laughs> shouldn't we spend our time and money doing something else and uh, now we're seeing the capacity of ai to use all of the data of gisha michael's translations and quickly being able to instead of it being ten thousand years or thousand years like how close are we able to translate all of those other texts that I just showed that we don't have translations of? So we want to look at well, what's cutting the root of virtue mean? Right now, there's only three or four books that are translated in English, but there's hundreds of books that discuss this, probably thousands. How close are we to having access to them? Uh, it'd be cool to have a class on how to use Gopher. I use it a lot. So if you want to be able to go deeper into things that come up that are just like, uh, it's just not enough information in ACI. I don't know what root of virtue is. Then uh, we can access thousands of pages of commentary just that quickly and get some answers. This is how, this is how we feel about all you. All right, four minutes. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the last slide. We'll do some easy stuff. I think Geshe Michael put this in the homework because he was excited about it. It was an explanation of why Jetsankapa's name is Jetsankapa. And I think he just like was delighted after years of study to find it. He's called Zankapa because he was from an area known as the highlands of Tsongka, where the Tsongka River flows. 
there you go. Question, if that delights you also, please fill it in on your homework. Let's do the previous one. Okay. Mm. Why is it? So we're looking at a text called The Essence of the Ocean of Discipline. Why? Why is it? He, so it's an explanation of the name of Tsongkhapa's text. Discipline we've talked about. We're trying to tame or stop the negative emotions and control the sense flowers. That's our, that's why, that's what discipline is. So in the essence of the ocean of discipline is Vinaya. Stop the negative emotions and, and stop what is connected to them. So that's a good example. Like, well, what does that mean? What's connected to them? Then you could go to Gopher, find out what that means. Okay, why the ocean? Just as the ocean is hard to measure in depth and breadth, uh, the teachings of Vinaya are also difficult to grasp in their entirety. They're so big. Uh, second, why ocean? There is a belief that the, the ocean was the source of the most important jewel, called a wish-giving jewel. And this this idea of it it's like aladdin aladdin's lamp like you have a special ceremony there's special ways to clean this jewel on a special day you stick it on top of a bowl on the full moon and then you you get your wishes it's called a wish giving jewel but it's used more as an example of you know how, in this case, how Vinaya is more important than a wish-giving jewel. Because with a wish-giving jewel, we wouldn't really know what to ask for. Meaning, Vinaya will take us to a place beyond what we could imagine. Like when I started studying had no idea where it would lead to. And then I studied ACI for seven years and it was like, what was what was possible in life became so much bigger than I ever would have imagined. And then studying Tantra was the same thing again. I was like, oh my God. I couldn't ever imagine those things to wish for them. So a wish-giving tool was less valuable to me than keeping my vows, than, than Vinaya. Because it takes us beyond, to a place beyond what we can imagine. And then essence. The essence is the is the vows. So the Pati Moksha vows are the most essential aspects of the Vinaya teachings. So if we go back one slide. Yeah, we can see each of those words in the title. Why discipline? Why ocean? Why essence? And that, my friends, is all the time we have. Um, I really enjoyed 
preparing this class. I hope uh, it gives us another angle or another way to reflect on Vinaya um, and to, to use, to not have ACI 9 be just an intellectual exercise where we go through, hopefully do a homework or a quiz, check the ACI 9 box off the list of 18 boxes but to take a journey into the investigation of core values, and ethics, and what we believe in. And uh, I thought it'd be cool if other people have lists that they've taken inspiration from uh, to share them in the chat. Um, there's a lot of, of, I was doing some research, I found some native lists, lists from native. Americans, they're a little long to put into a slide, but they're fascinating and you know, more in touch with the environment, for instance. So I thought it'd be cool to, you know, if you have something that inspires you to share it in the Telegram chats and we can expand our what we'll call the Vow Museum, and um, use that to investigate, well, what are my, what can I draw from as inspiration for my core values? And then on Friday, we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about the book, tracking those. It's one thing to identify our core values, and another thing to, uh, keep them and so a lot of people have kept a book some people keep a once every six weeks book some people keep a six times a day book but come with if you have done that practice come with ideas to share about how you've kept it fresh or relevant or alive or what your methods are for not just identifying, but keeping. So we'll, we'll do that on Friday. Cool. Thanks y'all, that was super fun for me. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for uh, smiling when my niece comes in and shows her artwork means a lot to me to share that with you all and uh, i look forward to when we get to do this again on friday as long keep teaching thanks stevie thank you we love you all right take care everybody thank you so much harold thank you for teaching mm -hmm. christian thank you for translating mm. and th team thanks for everyone yes. and everything you do agreed thanks so much yes and thanks frank mm -hmm. see you and on friday you. oh yeah <laughs> thank you bye bye bye